So would you please give a huge tap welcome to Mr. Robin Inns. Thanks, Darren. Hello. Um, it's going to be, I've never, I've not done this talk before. Um, and uh, it's kind of, I, I talked quite a lot about this book a while ago. About four and a half years ago, I wrote this book, I'm a Joke and So Are You. And uh, and then the publisher said, oh, we're going to put a new cover on it. Uh, do you want to just write a new short introduction? And uh, I'm really good at working out ways of putting in a lot more work than is required uh, for no financial remuneration. So I said, why not write 10,000 words instead? And that's what I did. So I've added loads of bits and pieces to it. And, um, and I should explain, I mean, a couple of things about it, first of all, is... There's a, something that I found out today that really surprised me. Um, I've, I've been making notes through it, uh, and I, again, so yesterday I went to the theatre. By the way, has anyone here yet seen The Motive and the Cue with Mark Gatiss and uh, Johnny Flynn as Richard Burton? Right, if you get the chance, go and see it. It's the most remarkable play. It is all about John Gielgud directing Richard Burton uh, on the Broadway run of Hamlet, uh, and it was just magnificent. And Mark Gatiss as John Gielgud was so moving so I had this thing which some of you who follow me on social media and stuff like that will probably know um, that a few weeks ago my dad died and uh, I know there'll be a few people here who've you know obviously had loss and stuff like this and and last night was the first time because I'm very good at being stoical. I'm I'm very good. Uh, like I remember when my mum died. One of the things that eventually I did is I'd kept everything in, and then everyone out was out of the house, and I went right. I'm going to open that bottle of Penderin whiskey, and I'm going to play the saddest music by Vaughan Williams that I can, so that then I can have the tears that I know are inside me, but which I'd kind of kept in. And uh, and I think in some ways one of the things that I've added in this book at one point one of the essays I've put in is this thing that as human beings and especially in this country in particular is that whole thing about keep calm and carry on keep calm and carry on and you all know that's a lie you all know that what that actually means is pretend to keep calm don't embarrass anyone by revealing your real emotional turmoil and carry on but that's a much more difficult print to market and. Uh, so, but last night when I was uh, when I was watching Mark do the, just so beautifully, and it was the first time that I really felt my eyes moisten, uh, and because I I've had it a few times, but this was the strongest sense I've had of oh God, I want to tell my dad about how amazing this play was because he loved John Gilgood and he loved acting and he loved, he, he was in rep theatre for about two years in the 1950s. And uh, this was, um, so whenever we watched, in the last few years of his life, we watched Talking Pictures a lot. I don't know if you watch Talking Pictures, right? And we would watch Talking Pictures and my dad would just spend the whole two hours going, oh, come on, what's his name? The one who was the newspaper boy, you know. He was in that thing with Michael Wilding, I think. You know, oh, and then right at the end as the credits role he go of course Dicky Burrell I was at Salisbury Playhouse with him so anyway the uh so that was the first time though that I, I so wanted to tell him about this so the things that I'm gonna uh, I'm also gonna read a couple of things that are in this book which I, I very rarely if you've ever seen a book event I do I ve very rarely even mention the book I get distracted by other things and uh, then afterwards uh, Viv goes mention the book I've got loads to sell and uh, and so I do but this one I will mention like first of all the, the thing that shocked me I remember that's what I was gonna tell you about wasn't I right so the thing that shocked me was and then this looks even more ridiculous the thing that shocked me was in this book I deny that I have ADHD and uh, as I've clearly exposed by this very first moment uh, yes uh, I, I, I was I wrote the, in the first chapter one of the things that I wrote about was um, just how we become who we become and I talked about for instance uh, a guy I'd met in Canada who's a, a teenager he's probably in his 20s now who was known as Aspie comic and he was someone who uh, would go on stage and talk about his autism and stuff and it was a brilliant thing to watch and then I also talked about ADHD and the fact that for 20 years I frequently had people come up to me after gigs and say, I'm ADHD and so are you, aren't you? And I'd go, no, it's just an affect of me on stage. And um, and I, even in this book, I kind of say, no, I think this is just a bystander kind of, you know, uh, thing. And, and I don't I don't really think it's true. And and then this is one of the things that the book allowed me. This is one. of, the, And I know it's a weird thing. Like, What's the book that changed your life? Well, fortunately, it's my book. I mean, but it's it by writing this book. 
it opened up so many conversations with so many people. And it's something I've talked about a lot with the Bibliomaniac book as well when I do shows. I always say to people, write as much as you can. Not necessarily write for any kind of, you know, not about writing novels, not about writing, you know, poetry for, for, for release or anything. Just write. Write for yourself. And when you're writing for yourself, that will also eventually be writing for other people as well because they will find what you left behind. And also write because you will look at ideas that are in your head and that have maybe been in your head for 10, 20, 30 or 40 years and you will find in those ideas when you can then look at them on a piece of paper a way of interrogating them which may well help to change your life and as well as change your life change the lives of people around you so when I wrote this book and I started I wrote that thing about ADHD that opened up these conversations and it took a while. I mean, th this book actually is a book that led to me going into therapy. Again, I'd always kind of shied away from things like that. But I interviewed, I think, five or six therapists for this book. And at the end of every interview, uh, they would go, I presume you're in therapy, Robin. And I'd go, oh, no. And they'd go, oh. And... Uh, and eventually, so I, I went to a very, you know, I, I went to a Freudian therapist just off Hampstead Heath. She was brilliant, but I was rubbish at therapy. Right, I am so bad at therapy. I was because I would always be worried about her. She was quite slim. I would have uh, it was two o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon, and I would walk in and I would lie on her couch and I'd hear her stomach rumbling and I think, is she eating? Is she okay? I'm a little bit worried. I hope everything's going. Maybe I should ask. No, you're not meant to ask. Oh, that's the whole reason you're paying her money and she's not paying yours. Yes, I know. So I just get worried about that. And then I go, oh, God, I think I told this story last week. That's a bit boring. I should come up with some new stuff, you know. And in fact, in therapy, you're allowed to talk about what the fuck you want. That's why you're paying £100 an hour, right? And so I would, and then I'd get worried. Is it nearly, is it nearly 250? Oh, God, what if I go over the time and then she'll all be annoyed about stuff, right? So there was, so, so anyway, it turned out it wasn't right. Equally, though, by going through that experience, that made me realise, because eventually at one point she said to me, um, you just, it just sounds exhausting being you. And uh, I thought she was right about that, really. Um, and then, then, you know, in the last two years, when, when a man called Jamie got in contact with me, uh, uh, he does this wonderful one, uh, 1,200 Seconds of Autism, a podcast. And, uh, and, and he got in contact and he basically just said, um, can, can we have a word? And I'll tell you about that and, uh, later on. And it's a thing that has genuinely kind of, uh, that has entirely changed my life. And what I will say is that the... Uh, one of the things that, again, some of you may have experienced, some of you may not have experienced this yet, but you may well experience in the future, is a moment where you become like someone. I was doing a gig in Pontypridd on, uh, oh no, it wasn't Pontypridd actually. I travel a lot. I was in Berkhamsted. I was at Pontypridd the night before. And I know it's all showing off, isn't it? And, uh, but I was, um, someone asked me, they said, What would you tell your younger self? What would you tell yourself, your four year old self, your eight year old self, the 12 year old self? And I said, Do you know what? I wouldn't say anything to them. Because I'm very lucky in the direction that I've gone, that in the last two years in particular, I've finally become comfortable within my own skin. So anything that might have changed that direction, well, I wouldn't want that. I'm glad that school years weren't the best years of my life. Yes, I would have liked some things to have been happier and some things to have been different for my family and all manner of things. But in the end, the person I've become is someone who now... because. That experience some of you might have had. I, I went to see this most brilliant exhibition called The Horror Show at Somerset House. I hope some of you saw it. There was work by Derek Jarman and Barry Adamson and uh, and the punk Jordan and Susie and the Banshees and Lee Barry. And I went with my wife and son. And I had that f experience where suddenly, while we were walking around, I realised how much anxiety I had not experienced during that day. And I realised all of the negative emotions and all of the negative voices that I had not heard. And it was that moment, like if you've ever gone hiking and you've had a really heavy rucksack and then you take it off and it actually feels like for a moment you are beating gravity. You feel as if you're rising. And that moment of taking off that hefty coat of anxiety, that prickly, all of those things can be a remarkable moment. So this is what I wanted from the book. What I wanted from the book initially, and, and I think it's something that I'm working on again now, Firstly, I wanted to open up as many things as possible, even though, as I've revealed, I think I concealed a bit of myself uh, and I don't think I showed everything. I think one of the reasons as well was that I didn't particularly want to disturb uh, my dad, for instance. You know, it's like that thing where um, 
oddly enough as a performer, you can be incredibly honest with strangers. Most of you I don't know at all, right? You can be very, very honest with strangers, but sometimes you return to your family, your friends, your partner, whoever it might be, and that's when you conceal yourself again. And so that actually putting this out there was sometimes quite, you know, it, th there were moments that worried me a great deal. Um, I'll, I'll start off with, uh, well, actually, I started off, I've, I'm, I've, we haven't hit page one yet, but um, I started off by quoting Freud. Uh, I started off with, uh, this is, uh, there we are with Freud. That's very, oh God, I wish they'd have bigger print. I've reached that age now where I need two pairs of glasses and neither of them work. Um, <laughs> This is the, the Donald Pleasance years, as I call them. I can see the pen. Um, it's basically, he, he talks, uh, Freud talked about uh, the nature of humour and uh, puns and uh, the pressure. He says, let me see, uh, the moment a man questions the meaning and value of his life, he is sick. By asking the question, one is merely admitting to a story of unsatisfied libido to which something else must have happened, a kind of fermentation leading to sadness and depression. Sigmund Freud. And under that, I place this quote from Ken Dodd. The problem with Freud is that he never had to play the Glasgow Empire. So... <laughs> And that was something that I was very... Uh, if anyone has ever read Freud's book on humour, it is his least funny book ever. Imagine a whole chapter on a singular Teutonic pun. Oh, man. It's like watching Jimmy Carr. So, um, the, uh, not that I've got anything against Jimmy Carr, but I have. So um, we'll deal with that later. You can cut that bit if you want, Trent, but you can keep it in as well. I don't think it'll affect my TV career. So... Uh, but I wanted to, so, so that was the first thing. I also wanted to write a book that was filled with joy about comedy. That was, it's not just about comedy, I hope it's about everyone as well. But one of the things was very often, you, you will see a lot of books, it's the old thing about, you know, that if you, if you, you know, dissecting comedy is like dissecting a frog at the end of it, you haven't really learned anything, you've got a dead frog. But it's not just that as well. It's about the fact that I often read academic books about my favourite TV shows. You go, oh, wow, brilliant. Or like Night of the Living Dead. There's a new book about Night of the Living Dead. I love that. And it's come out from an academic press. And then you read it and you go, wow, they've managed to press every bit of joy out of it. And I wanted to make sure there's a, one of the first things I quote after Ken Dodd, actually, is uh, Jeff Goldblum, uh, at least as Seth Brundle, where he says uh, uh, about, I think I was a man. I think I was a fly who dreamt he was a man. And now the dream is over. Right. And that's from the fly. And that's that thing in the fly. If you've ever seen it, there's a moment, this fantastic moment where Jeff Goldblum, Seth Brundle is trying to understand what is not working in his teleportation system. And he teleports a piece of meat and then he fries it up for Gina Davis and Gina Davis starts eating it. And then she goes, no, ah, oh, no, there's ah, there's something there's something synthetic. It's not quite right. Basically, it hasn't got the fleshiness of flesh. And what I wanted to maintain in this book also was that fleshiness of flesh, that vivacious nature of life and humour and jokes, right? So, so the first thing is, and also another thing that I should have realised I had ADHD, the first draft of this book was fucking awful. It was an absolute disaster because what happened was I went into a hypermanic stage. Uh, I wrote 120,000 words and sent them to the publisher. And then the moment I'd sent the email, I looked at the file and went, oh my God, this makes no sense at all, right? And uh, so I, I rang them up and I said, don't, don't open the file. Don't open the file. I literally don't know what it is. It is the kind, it makes Finnegan's Wake look like Dick Francis's whip hand, right? Do not open that file. And a year later, when I produced a proper book, the, uh, the head of the company went one night when we were having a drink. Just so you know, I was the only one that saw that file. Ah, anyway, right? So even that was part of the learning process as well. And, uh, and one of the things that I wanted to do with this book also was to give people permission. Because I think for a lot of the things that we deal with in our life, and not just permission, like permission to be who we are, but there's, it's like one of my favourite, I, I did a show called Reality Tunnel, which I'm just writing a new two-parter at the moment. And Reality Tunnel, the first couple of episodes that I did for Radio 4 were um, me looking at the inside of our brain and the outside of our brain and the difference between it. One of the interviews that I did for this book was with Philippa Perry. And Philippa Perry is, you probably know her from the, you know, the, book, the, the book you wished... Uh, uh, your parents had had and uh, you might also know of course she she does a, a, a show with Grace and Perry about art and she's great and she said to me and this has stayed with me so much she said one of the problems with being human is that we judge everyone else from the exterior and we judge ourselves from the interior 
So that immediately leads to a shortfall. Because if you go to a party, you will see people, and you just look at someone and you go, oh, God, I wish I was like Jean. She's so confident. Look at her there joking and drinking. And, oh, God, she's, I wish I could be like her. But you're not actually just standing there going, ah, ah, ah. You might be joking as well. You're joking, and you're, but it turns out both of you might be screaming inside. But we're putting on a front. And that moment of actually opening up. Sorry, that was very loud, that scream, wasn't it? I didn't know I had it in me. I think it's I've stopped doing a Brian Blessed impersonation. And that used to get rid of all my kind of monstrous bloody rage. But because I haven't done that for about a year, something's been building up. But I, uh, yeah, so, so that's that, that realisation that so many people are concealing things. And once you have someone, like, like with Reality Tunnel, I got a lovely letter from a 63-year-old. And the 63-year-old said, I have spent my whole life believing there was something wrong with my brain. I believe there was something wrong with all of these weird thoughts that I have in my mind. And then I've just heard your show. And I've realised that I am not the only one. In fact, there might be loads of us, right? And I said, don't worry, there are loads of us, right? And this is a thing that I love sometimes when I do events. Quite often in the last few years, I've had um, a lot of mothers come in with their children to show. So like kind of 13, 14 year old kids. Very often the kids have recently been diagnosed sometimes with autism, sometimes with ADHD. And sometimes that's also led to the mothers finding out that they also have autism or ADHD. And uh, some of you will probably know there's been, you know, it, it, there's been a terrible shortfall in terms of diagnosis. And I will later on, I might talk about the BBC's Panorama show uh, last night, but I probably won't because it's just a, an absolute waste of everyone's time. But uh, the... Uh, I pretended to be a thing. I was diagnosed to be the thing that I pretended. But it turns out I was only pretending and they didn't work out I was pretending. Thus I win. Well, well done for wasting everyone's time. And, um, but, uh, yeah, I, I was, oh, now I've got distracted again. I forgot what was, oh, yeah. So when the mothers and, uh, and, and their children come, one of the things that I've loved hearing is, one, in fact, this happened on more than, it's happened on about seven different occasions where the parents come up and said, I realised that things were going on, not just with my daughter, but with me, when my daughter first saw you and came up to me and went, Mum, that's what my head sounds like. And I love the fact that there was something that could be found there, that this realisation that you can be a, like, you know, an old middle-aged guy jumping up and around, just making all of these links and connections. And some people are going, that's what I'm having to keep in. That's what I'm not allowed to do. So that's one of the things that I wanted to get from the book. I wanted to deal with this sense of permission, this sense that, you know, so often we spend so much of our life, you know, getting trapped in bland conversations where everyone is concealing themselves. And that moment where someone can talk about, like one of the things that I wrote about in this book was uh, about suicide and suicide ideation. One of the things that I had a lot, again, I didn't mention this so much in the book, I, I would, I think, in, in, the, in the next book that I'm going to write, is I would go through long periods of just thinking about suicide a lot. And suicide ideation doesn't mean you're going to then take action, um, but it is just that, that, in fact, I interviewed Laura Davis. Laura Davis, an excellent Australian comedian who did a great show called Cake in the Rain. And in that, she talked about suicide ideation. And she said every 25 minutes, she would have an impulse uh, that her brain would go, you should kill yourself. And she said it was brilliant. She said, I've learned how to deal with it. She said, because what happens is that means that every 25 minutes, I have to work out why I want to be alive. And I make a list of three things. And I go, yep, there's that new blog post that I'm doing about all the trees in the parks of Melbourne. There's that excellent coffee house. And I haven't tried all of their cakes yet. And also, I'm going to write that book or whatever it might be. Right. And I think that's a really and it was interesting. I saw her back in October when I was out in uh, Perth in Australia. And, and she's been diagnosed with uh, with ADHD and I think some other neurodiversity as well. But I won't I won't kind of get I can't remember exactly now. And I said, what's happened to the suicide ideation? And she said, you know what? Even before I started any medication, it just evaporated. It just disappeared. And I think that's another thing, which is when we are able to be, because I think in this culture that we're in now, we are in a culture where that disparity, that thing Philippa was talking about, the difference between who we present ourselves to be and who we are, the greater that gap, the more unhappy you will ultimately be. It goes back to uh, a, a quote by James Baldwin that I use very, very often, which is, uh, he said, I think the reason people on, hold on so tightly to their hate is that if they let go of their hate, then they would have to deal with their pain. 
But as some of you may well know, sometimes when you do start to deal with your pain, it's that point of dealing with your pain that you go, things are getting better. And the way, like, I, I genuinely feel, you know, the, the, I've, I've never been, even though I've gone, you know, various different things, including loss in the last couple of years, in another way, I've never been been happier. So that's, um, we, we're still not, by the way, past the new uh, edition's preface. So uh, what are you doing tomorrow? You better cancel it now. Uh, there's a reason I've always said, I am the babysitter's favourite. What time do you say you're going to be back? Nine o'clock, I imagine. We're going to see Robin Inns. I'm into overtime. Anyway, so... Um, this is Trent, who I've worked with for years, who's filming tonight. He said, how long are you going to do? I don't know, do I? I've never done this before. What's the time now? It's much later than it should be. Right, so the, the good thing is the light. I've never, I, I forgot to check the light beforehand. Uh, so uh, the, um, right, I'll, I'll talk about, right, I'm, I'm going to read a piece, right? And this is, uh, is there any way, is there any light? Can we get any, is there any way we can change the lights at all, Dan? Just just because uh, I literally... Uh, or, or maybe if I move everything, if I move over here, oh, there we go. Maybe if I move over here, no, that doesn't make a difference. Maybe if I move over there, no, that does, that makes a slight difference. Let's give this a go. So now, enjoy 45 minutes of a man going. <laughs> Welcome to my world. Me. <laughs> right, so I, I wanted to, I'm going to, I'm going to jump ahead. Actually, no, I'm not. I'm gonna. Uh, I better move the microphone. Sorry. The uh, I never normally need a mic, but because uh, Trent's filming it, I better. Uh, um, but I, I, I'm going to tell you another story. And I'm sorry, by the way, that it's not one of the, the criticisms that I got for this book. Not not from 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 critics, but actually, you know, I, I once accidentally read some of the kind of Amazon things, and uh, was that people went, I thought the book was going to be funnier, right? And there are some funny things in it. But um, I've done comedy for years, so I've bought my uh, two hours of silence tonight, and. Uh, and I wanted to, but but I, I this, this is the one story that I did tell when I uh, when I was on on tour with this book. From that's actually from the book. I didn't talk about much else, but the one story that I always told was about how I kind of became who I am. And um, one of those things was I think many of us have a creation story. We find something. And then we think, ah, I think that was one of the major points that has now turned me into whatever I might be. And, and I think other people sometimes ignore. One thing I would say to everyone is never, never dismiss if there are still things that you can feel kind of, you know, in your craw, if there are still things that you can feel in your gut that might have happened 30, 40, 50 years ago, you don't have to dismiss it and say that was years ago. You know, especially when you're a child, there is so much that is going on, so much neural pruning that is going on, so many things that set you up. And the thing that I think didn't just change me by writing about this story, but I think it also has been very useful for my sisters as well, um, was so when just before, about four days before my third birthday, I was in a car with my mum, very, very short journey, two and a half miles on a little country road uh, just near a village called uh, Latimer, which many of you will know as uh, one of the locations for the Mel Smith and Griffiths Jones film, More On Some Outer Space, of course. And um, so we were, we were uh, in this, my, my, uh, one of my sisters, Sarah, was in the car as well. Only a short journey, two and a half miles in February. And unfortunately, there was a car that was overtaking at speed on the wrong side of the road that smashed into us. I was okay, my sister had a, a small uh, cut on her head, but my mum had extreme injuries. And I know that with memories, it's a dangerous thing because when we revisit memories, often we don't realise, but we're changing them. But the one, it's a very, my friend Dean Burnett, who I interviewed for the book, he talked about the fact that when you're young, there's a lot of memories that change all the time and conti continue to throughout your life. But some are what are called light bulb memories. They are memories of such enormity and of such sometimes kind of just devastation that they do actually remain imprinted almost accurately. And I remember as my sister obviously was crying, she had her hair, head cut open, and I looked at my mum and I always remember saying, why is mummy's eyes closed? Because I couldn't understand. Why is my mummy's eyes closed? Why is that going on? Fortunately, my dad was in the car behind. And when the ambulance arrived, he told the driver, the driver was going to take her to the local hospital. And he said, if you take her to the local hospital, she will die. You have to take her to Mount Vernon Hospital, a major hospital. And uh, later on, a doctor said, you were correct. She would have died if she'd gone to the local hospital. And my mum was then in a coma for a while. Uh, and then when she came out of the coma, she didn't know who we were because uh, she uh, had woken up as an 18-year-old, not a 32-year-old. And one of the major things of that, as well as everything else that went on after that and all the things she had to deal with, 
was that I had thought it was my fault. Because when you're nearly three, you remember this? If, if you do something over there, say, say you pull a toy off a shelf over there and a vase falls over over there, you think, oh my God, did I do that? You kind of feel that you have more control of the world. You know, it's a kind of Richard Burton Medusa touch. You feel, what, what's going on? And it was only in writing the book that I'd realised how much that had perhaps affected me because I thought I'd created, so I'd done something terrible. I had done something that led to my mum suffering years of mental illness and, uh, and, and the physical things that she had to deal with and the sadness she felt of how much her life had changed because of that, and it was my fault. I had a strange experience as well. My friend Lee Randall, who's a, who's a wonderful interviewer at book festivals, the first event I did was at Wigtown Books. Uh, it was at Wigtown Book Festival. And she asked me about the crash. And out of nowhere, I burst into tears. I didn't know the tears were there. I didn't know it was going to happen. Suddenly, I just started. And, and I remember that moment of feeling that I must now be a bit more grown up. Because, you know, Susan, as a comic, the first thing you think is, how can I turn it into a joke? And then I realised if I turn these tears into a joke, I've basically belittled the experience and I've belittled that. And so I remember just saying, I'm oh, sorry, Lee, that's not happened before. And then I waited and then I went, right, let's just continue. I told more of the story. And then I went for a joke about three or four minutes later. But it was like that kind of moment. So it was and th one of the reasons I'm telling this story as well is not only have I had a large number of people who've come up to me and said, oh my God, I blamed myself for this when I was a child, and I blame myself for that. Let Lem Cisse, in his brilliant book, My Name is Why, talking about when he was sent to a care home, when his foster parents uh, decided they no longer wanted him when he was 12 years old. And if you've read that book, if you haven't, there's just a very, I mean, it's a very, very powerful book about the experience it, for him growing up. And one of the moments is that when he was sent away by his foster parents, he obviously sat in the car with his carer, uh, care worker, and he was going, oh, no, I've obviously done something terrible. I've been sent away. I've done something terrible. I don't know what it is that I've done, but I, I, I'm going to pray to God. I'm going to pray to God for forgiveness. And his care worker had the presence of mind of pulling over the car, and he turned to Lem, and he said, Lem, none of this is your fault. And I think that moment, I know for many people, whether it's through the care system, maybe it's in, indeed, you know, in, in the in a, in a family unit, things, that moment of realising things were not your fault can change you. And so, I, you know, that, that, that was a, a very... And, and my dad, when he read that bit of the book, and I didn't really want him to, and, and one of the things was he rang me up when I was about to do a gig in Bristol, and I was chatting to him, and I knew he had something he wanted to say to me, and I wasn't sure what it was going to be. I knew there was something. And then he suddenly said, I said, oh, I've got to go in a minute. I'm on stage in about five minutes. He said, I've, I've just been reading about the crash. I wish you'd told me that you thought it was your fault because then I could have done something about it. And that was amazing. You know, at that point, he was 89 years old. And what I will say is he couldn't have done anything about it. And I told him that. I said, you could not have done anything about that. What you did was you kept a whole family together when other people, in fact, someone once said to my dad, do you know, normally people in this situation, a lot of men, they leave. Yeah, that's true. And it's, and it's like, and the fact that he didn't, and the fact he was, there's a lovely thing that, uh, I know there's a couple of people here at the event I did on Friday and, and, uh, um, one of the things my sisters found uh, was they went, oh, my God, Dad must have written to the ambulance men because we've got a letter from the ambulance men. And it's this letter from the ambulance station from the two guys who were the ones who took my mum to Mount Vernon Hospital saying, uh, thank you so much for your letter, Mr. Ince. Uh, we are the envy of the ambulance station and we're showing it to everyone. And I thought, what a remarkable thing that here was, you know, a dad who was dealing with three young kids and his wife with all of that kind of, you know, the, 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 the horrors that, that she was going through. And he thought, I better make sure that I write to the ambulance men as well. So anyway, this is what. So, um, yeah, I apologize if, if you, you know, sometimes I don't do as many jokes and I hope you don't mind. I, I, uh, I really it is. You know, like I said, I, I have put jokes in this, but sometimes when I start talking about it, I just realise, you know, how how important just th those moments of kind of, you know, honesty. And, like, I mean, one bit of honesty that I shouldn't have put in, I think, is uh, this here, um, uh, where I write about... Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, if I think hard, there definitely are some good moments from my childhood, such as the time I poured fruit punch into the hair of Tom Simpson, a boy who made my life unpleasant at the school bus stop. The sugary punch attracted insects to his scalp and it ended up becoming unbearably itchy and an entomological menagerie and he had to go to a special place to have the eggs removed from his hair. These were happy days. <laughs> and um, and the, 
Tom Simpson's read the book. He's a doctor now. He's a lovely bloke. And he said, oh, my God, I never knew I bullied. That's another thing that I found. Of course, you know, he wasn't a terrible bully. It was just that I was, you know, I, I, I was the wretched little chrysalid of a child. But, yeah, he was like, oh, my God, I never knew that. Because when I went to school, I don't know if anyone went to a school where if you changed schools, the moment you changed schools, you were an outsider. Was anyone here a disease? When I went to school, there was uh, Robert Calvert, Dan Haggard and me all went when we were nine to a school where everyone else had started when they were five. And so if you got touch bus in the playground, that meant you had Inst disease or Haggard disease or Calvert disease. Anyone else a carrier of uh, plague, surname plague? Um, so I've still not got, I said I was going to read this thing and I changed that, but that's not happened, has it? So, uh, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rattle through and uh, I'm, we're going to pick up a little bit of speed. I've made loads of notes. Oh, stabbing. There we go. I've made a little note there. Uh, this was a bit that I enjoyed uh, again. Um, but despite being a highly strung child and being moved to a school where I discovered I was both odd and a disease, by the time I was 12, I had still only stabbed two people. <laughs> Adrian Chorley in the cheek with an ink pen and Robert Poughton in the hand with a craft knife. Both survived. Um, in fact, the funny thing was, Adrian Chorley got in trouble afterwards instead of me, right? He was bullying me and I had an ink pen and then I just stabbed it and it went right into his cheek like that. And uh, I got uh, like a merit and uh, he got sent home because he was troublesome. And... Uh, I remember that was uh, I'd Robert Barrett. I don't know how I did. Anyway, look, I still oh, I, uh, um, still see him every now and again. Um, the uh, he walks at a distance. You know, it's the nice thing, isn't it? They've, once you've stabbed two, you do find the bullying goes down. Now, I'm not saying that as advice. And what I'm saying is, I was I was banned from using an ink pen eventually at school, not because of stabbing Adrian Chorley with it, in the fa but just because I made such a mess. I was such a messy writer that they went, you can only write with pencil. Nothing's changed. Uh, oh, the Eddie Peppertone as well. I love this. One of the beautiful things about finding, when I said write and write and write as much as you can, letting things out through creative things. Like one of the things that happened, you know, after my dad died, one of the first things I start thinking about is how can I turn various different things in, into a creative act? As someone who, you know, I personally don't have uh, any form of traditional religion or anything like that, and I don't have any God beliefs or anything, but I do think ritual's really important. I do think finding ways of making ceremony is really, really important. I was, I was pleased, actually, at my dad's funeral when I did the eulogy. I think it's the first eulogy at which at any point uh, in the pulpit a copy of uh, Penthouse magazine uh, has been waved at uh, the... He, he had a signed copy of Penthouse magazine from an event he went to in 1969. And I thought between showing the badger skull that I had in the pulpit and uh, and then the stuffed stoat that he had as well, I'd show the Penthouse magazine. And uh, what I will say, if any of you are doing a, a pulpit-based event, they have a very, very small shelf for props. The main question afterwards, everyone kept saying, but who was it signed by? The penthouse pet of the month, Georgina. Anyway, so there you go. That's the, uh, it was the only pornographic magazine though we ever had. That's a lie. So, um, I love this thing. Ed Eddie Peppertone. Who, have, you, have any of you ever seen Eddie Peppertone? Oh, he's great, I think. He's, uh, he's the, just this ball of rage. And uh, he, he is, and I interviewed him because I just knew he'd be great fun to interview. And, and he basically just said, I've screamed on stage for 30 years. It's hard for me to connect with anyone. But through comedy, I've built a life through screaming. And, uh, and he really does. And you can really, uh, you, can, you can see this. Uh, yeah, this, this fantastic. And again, it's an interesting thing that his background as well, he's still angry about the fact his mother, unfortunately, was another suffered from from various different problems of mental illness and, and he, he always felt that he'd needed more love and you see it on stage you see that moment of approbation you know and and, and it's a wonderful thing to see um the uh, i'm just gonna gonna flick through this really really quickly because I've, I've suddenly realized how late it is and uh, the good thing is at least it's almost summertime now so i know that when it gets dark it's really overrun um i won't uh, of course i'll ignore this change in the light but i'm just saying i know it's later and i know you'll want to go but i won't let you and uh i thought Otherwise, it won't be good for my mental health. I've told you that already. I need you. Anyway, so um, this, uh, um, yeah, critical voices, uh, just tell them to shut up. That's what I say. Uh, the, um, this is, oh, Henry Marsh. This, again, was a quote. That I wrote one chapter, which I'd probably maybe get rid of, though. It did have some all right bits in it. But it was about, uh, oh, no, I should sell it harder. Uh, it's a really interesting chapter, actually, about uh, stuff. And uh, it's actually the reason that, I, I talked a little bit, there's a quote from Henry Marsh, who you might know, wonderful neurosurgeon, who, who for many years has gone out to the Ukraine. Uh, has anyone seen his, the, the documentary, The English Surgeon? 
You've seen it. Oh, this is great. This is one of those things is earlier uh, I was talking to someone who's very young and they didn't get any of my references. And I said, that's fine. People of my own age don't get any of my references. I, I've done, you know, gigs in, in kind of France and Italy and around the world. And sometimes afterwards, the audience would go, oh, I think maybe, you know, we didn't get all of your English references. I said, oh, no, no, no. They don't get them in England either. Um, in fact, a lot of you are, are, are reading more than they are. So we did absolutely fine with the Proust routine. And then we have another Madeline and we're just filled with memories. Anyway, so... Um, this is the thing that I loved about the nature of the mind that Henry Marsh said. He was talking to Klaus, is it Klau, Klaus oh, Nausgaard? That guy who writes those long books about everything that's ever, ever happened in his life. And, uh, and uh, he was saying, uh, Nausgaard was saying, I, I feel sometimes sad if we have an explanation of our experience through just the matter of the mind. And Henry Marsh, this is a quote that I love, he said, you have to realise that saying that there is not some extra bit of magic, that there is not something ethereal, that there is not the, that once we realize that our world is from this solid mass of the mind, however strange its behavior is, what you realize is it upgrades matter, it doesn't downgrade thoughts and dreams. And I think that's a beautiful way of looking at that. Um, and then this, this chapter includes, like I, was, I, I had a brain scan a while ago, which is not a surprise. I mean, you watch a show by me and if you were in neuroscience, you'd go, can we stick you in the thing to find out how that works? And, um, and it was, uh, I've actually had a few done. In fact, my wife's banned me uh, from having them because she's worried they might be damaging me. And uh, I don't, because I, I had a magnetic pulse to the left hand side of my brain, to the motor region once. And it was amazing. And it stops you being able to talk. And uh, it's I, I did it for the, uh, the um, Royal Institute Christmas lectures. And I was doing uh, Jabberwocks. I was going, Twas brillig and the slithy toves did garden gimble in the wave, all mimsy with a borg. Mom raised out Gabe and uh, and Brian Cox thought that and he now uh, saw it and uh, and now he owns three of those uh, for whenever we go on touring. Brian, come on, come over here, come near the lovely magnet. The um, I was seeing Mark Gatiss last night, so you know I've done him like that. Anyway, so the. Um, but I loved it. It was one of the things as well. When I, I, I was doing the, the scariest gig I did last year, the, the most nerve-wracking gig, and, and, and this is a year in which I did 14,000 people at the O2 and did all the, like, went around the world and did arenas, right? The scariest one was uh, two gigs where I was only playing to 23 people uh, because it was Swingate Primary School and they were the year ones and the year twos. And, like, and, and they, that's a proper scary gig because when you're playing a gig like that, you know when you're losing the audience, right? Not because they heckle or anything like that. You can just see how far their fingers got up their nose, right? And you go, my God, that's gone past the knuckle. They must be so bored, right? So, um, and I really wanted it to be a fun show as well, because again, I love people being being armed with curiosity and armed with excitement. And I'd asked some friends of mine, I said, I'm, I'm playing to five-year-olds and six-year-olds, what should I talk about? And they were like, do dinosaur farts and poo and stuff. And then I thought, no, but that, that's the obvious thing to do, isn't it? Oh, the children, they would love the farty and the poo stuff. And then, uh, and so instead I, I, I it was so much fun because children, of course, are five and six. They, they are intrigued by so much. As long as you're excited and you show them something wonderful, they, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be farts and poos. It can be the nature of black holes. It can be, you know, the speed of light. Or I, I showed them a brain scan. I had this lovely experience where uh, they're all sat there cross-legged. And, uh, and, and I say, right, who here, first question... Who here's got a brain? And they're all like, yeah, yeah, I've got a brain, I've got a brain, I've got a brain. Toby hasn't got a brain. Yes, I have. Right, so there was all that going on. And I said, who here wants to see my brain? And they went, oh, and yeah, <laughs> right. And, and then I had a little screen behind me and I showed them my brain scan. And then I said, that's, that's like your brain. I said, all your brains, all your brains will look very, very similar. And the thing is, though, they're all very, very different. They're all able to ask different questions. But if you have brains, if you have a mind, that means you already now have the tools for science and curiosity and wonder. And, I, and then afterwards, this girl came up to me and she'd had one of those moments where she went, Miss, can I go and tell the man a thing, please? And she went, well, you're meant to be going to the playground. I went, it's, it's fine. And, and, and she went, hello, the man. Um, I, uh, the other day, I, I saw the full moon, and it's, it's really shiny, isn't it, a full moon? Do you know why? Because I can tell you. And I just love that, you know, that, that joy. And, that's kind of, and that is the kind of thing that, you know, I, I wanted to inspire in people. And, and the fun with the brain scan was I did this brain scan where, uh, I think it was the first, no, it was the second brain scan I had, was for University College London. And what they were doing, they were doing a version of uh, Just a Minute, but inside an fMRI, right? The idea was that, uh, so not a whole panel, right? Merton, move up, you bastard. Um, so you'd individually go in, 
and uh, and then they just give you a subject like bananas or whatever, and then you just have to extemporise on that in the in as much as possible on the rules of just a minute. In fact, interestingly, it turned out that the control group who were not performers uh, or public speakers they couldn't talk rubbish for a minute on subjects. It turns out it's a very special skill we have, Susan, and uh, and so they had to make it thirty seconds, right? Because most people aren't spending. Oh, I'm going to be funny about ginger nuts or whatever. So we did did that, and they wanted to find out if there was anything. That they saw in the activity of the brain that gives you an idea about people who improvise. And unfortunately, they could never show the results because it was it was it ended up being a bit of a failure, right? And one of the reasons it was a failure was that because a lot of comedians got too worried that they wouldn't be as funny about ginger nuts as the other comedian who'd done it before, uh, that they wriggled around too much. And we're going, oh, God, no, I was really good on this the other day. Oh, no, hang on, hang on. Oh, God, I bet Daniel Kitson's bit on ginger nuts was, was, was better than mine, right? And because they wriggled around so much they couldn't get a proper image of the brain so it revealed nothing about the workings of the brain but it did about the workings of the ego and uh, and there was there was a lovely uh, one of the things that, that sorry the reason I bring this up was I, I did just a minute a couple of times right and the first time that I did it I was terrified I had had nightmares for two weeks and Nicholas Parsons face would just like appear yeah just just disconnected head wandering around Talk about tea towels of Salisbury Cathedral for a minute, Robin. Ah, 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 and everyone's buzzing in, right? And then what happened was, I, I, I think because I'd had so many terrifying dreams, when it actually came to recording it, I'd like just had non-stop rehearsals. So the first subject I got, I just went off on one. And it was like, it was going really, really well. And, uh, and I got, I think, nearly 40 seconds in. It was like my first ever go, I got 40 seconds in. And then what happened was, uh, I suddenly thought, oh, I think I can connect this now to a BBC sitcom. What BBC sitcom shall I use? And my brain said, why not a low, a low? And of course, you know, know why not a low a low but it was too late right and um, Sheila Hancock was tough right when I did it the next time Sheila Hancock has an amazing mind right she just buzzes in the whole time she always wins she got incredible you know at that point nearly 90 years old I think she is and just like in razor sharp right but she is so competitive right so you've got her and Paul Merton right we're gonna win uh, that when I then went and did a gig uh, in Cockermouth uh, a few weeks later I was chatting to the audience afterwards and then someone was standing in the background with a box right and which just makes it sound more like seven than this is going to be and uh, and I said oh sorry you're waiting for me they went yes I said oh I didn't want to just just presume because I'm like that I'm at a gig in the auditorium of the gig that I have just played and someone's waiting near me but I think it would be arrogant to imagine they would want to talk to me you know they might might think oh god what if Richard Stilgo turns up a week early you know I'll just stay here anyway so I don't know why I use Richard Stilgo as a reference in fact my brain worked so quickly there for a moment it said Peter Skellen and I went I don't think Peter Skellen's alive anymore so it quickly gave me Richard Stilgo instead I'm revealing the inner workings here now. And um, so anyway, uh, they, they said, yes, we've made you a cake. And they opened the cake box. And inside the cake box, there was a beautiful cake. And on it had iced the face of Sheila Hancock. But it was made boss-eyed. And she said, we felt Sheila Hancock was very cruel to you on just a minute. So we've iced you this revenge cake. Uh, Yes, I work in Radio 4. It's really happening for me now. Um, the, uh, oh, talking about myself behind my back. Uh, oh, this is a great Ernest Becker quote. The road to creativity passes so close to the madhouse and often detours or ends there. And I, and I love things like that. So uh, let me, um, what time is it now? Right, so I, I, I will. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just talk you through. Right, this was the, um, uh, sorry, we're not, we haven't got very far. Um, the um, so I mean it's ridiculous, isn't it? Why would I have not diagnosed myself twenty years ago? It's plain to see, isn't it? And every anyone who knows who hangs around at gigs after someone once gave me a lift from Winchester to Birkenstead, um, I, I said, "Oh, I better go and get my train, so I better wrap up." And obviously, I'd gone over already. And this man went, "I've just chatted with my wife, and we're happy to give you a lift home, uh, so you can go on as long as you want, right?" And the rest of the audience furious. No, they weren't. It was fine. And. Um, <laughs> And, and they said, afterwards, they said, well, one of the reasons we wanted to give you a lift was we wanted to find out what you were like off stage. And uh, when they dropped me off at Berkshire, they went, yeah, we were expecting a greater disparity. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to just, one of the things that I, I added to this book was, it was an essay that I wrote a while ago. And one of, one of the chapters uh, was about what we learn from ourselves by sometimes the jokes we make. Well, you know, this is... In, in, in terms of what we will say out aloud and what we won't say out aloud. 
So it's that bit of, you know, I suppose, where do you draw the line? And we hear about this all the time in popular culture at the moment. We hear about, you know, there's a special club. Uh, that it's really nice, actually. Um, edgy comics uh, who don't follow the rules have made themselves a club that's a safe space for them. And uh, in the East End of London, because it's not safe for them to be edgy in other places, snowflakes. So um, there's a special edgy comedy club uh, where you can say anything you want, unlike all the other comedy clubs where you can say anything you want. And... Uh, and what's so edgy about it is there's a wonderful comic called Alistair Beckett King who went on and did a 20-minute routine about what a nonsensical idea this club was and they refused to give him the film of his set afterwards. So that's, that's, uh, that's free speech for you, isn't it, really? And... Um, and uh, so, in the same way, actually, GB News, they, there was uh, a guy called Stuart Hennigan who's written an incredible book called Ghost Signs about during lockdown when he was delivering food parcels to the most deprived areas of Leeds. And he was on the Michael Portillo show. And uh, Michael Portillo, basically, he just ran circles around Michael Portillo because Stuart has done an enormous amount, not merely of research, but he's lived a life of seeing the experience of people who are living in poverty. And so when the connection dropped... GB News, it appears, didn't seem to try and get the connection up again. And when they then put it out on YouTube, where they sometimes put their old shows, somehow they'd managed to cut Stuart out. So, you know, anyway, free speech television. So um, I, I, I wrote about... Because I think about this a lot. I think about the fact there was a time where I just thought a joke was a joke. That was fine. You know, there are jokes that I've done on stage that I would not do anymore. There's jokes. I think it's very easy for us sometimes to look at, you know, uh, I, I remember there was, a, there was a journalist, a columnist, a Daily Mail columnist, many years ago. And I used to describe them as, uh, I think it was uh, a sewage tank housed in a human skin sack. And... Um, it just had a nice rhythm to it, to me, you know. So, uh, and there was someone else who was a, a journalist uh, for the Sun, and uh, I used to say he has the kind of face that, in the old days, you'd have to pay a sixpence and go into a tent to see. And uh, and I shouldn't really have been picking on that. I should have been picking on on how ugly his ideas were and various things. You know, the, and now I I do think I, I try and use empathy, and I, sometimes I think. Jokes can just, to a comedian, a joke can just seem like a joke. It can just seem like clever wordplay. But to the victims of those jokes, especially if they're a group that are already quite often dehumanised, especially if they're already great, then it can be quite kind of, you, you start to realise you are, when I talk about giving permission, if you go and watch a comic who is, like, you know, attacking a certain group of people, that is giving them permission. It's saying to the audience, you know those people... They are less than us, aren't they? Right, And I think it's an important thing to think about. And I talked to my friend Barry Crimmins. The book is actually dedicated to Barry. Barry was a great activist comedian who was an incredible influence on American comedy. And at the same time, many of you, well, probably maybe none of you will have heard of him. If you get a chance, watch uh, the film all about his life, Call Me Lucky. It was an incredible life. And he fought, he always fought for people who were bullied. And I interviewed him for the book. And uh, we got talking. He was one of those people, it's... Like, literally the first time we spoke, you know when you just talk to someone and you click immediately and you are friends instantaneously? And I still think about him every week because when he suddenly died and he, he got cancer, it's very, very, he, he didn't, and, and it was like, and I still think, oh man, I wish Barry was here because I had so many plans of, of what Barry and me would do, getting him over here and, and touring with him. But I asked Barry, I, at first of all, I said to Barry, I said, are there any jokes that you don't do? I said, yeah, because Barry is someone who, who could never be called, like, no, he was no lightweight. But his, the people who were the objects of his ridicule were always people with power. He was always punching up. He was punching up against the Catholic Church. He was punching up against the American government. He was punching up uh, a, a against those who were pro-war but would not send their, old their own children into fight. He was, Kurt Vonnegut was a great fan of his. And uh, he once said, I once said, Barry, do you ever wish that you, you could maybe have got further and you could have been more famous? And he said, do you know what, Robin? Kurt Vonnegut had a favourite joke of mine, and I think that's a better thing. And I kind of agree with him. You think, wow, this is a guy who Kurt Vonnegut really admired. On my wall, uh, Barry's widow, Helen, gave me a letter from the anarchist historian Howard Zinn that was a letter of recommendation for Barry. And I look at that every single day. It's just at the stairs where I walk down every day, and I look at that letter, and I think of Barry, and I think of Howard Zinn, and I think of all those people. And when I asked Barry, I, I, I said, so what wouldn't you joke about? And he said, he said, well, 
He said, I've never done jokes about cancer. Now, this was before he was diagnosed or indeed his wife Helen was diagnosed. So I never, never do jokes about cancer. He said, I'd never thought of one that's funny enough. You know, I've never thought of a joke that I think is so funny about cancer that I won't care that someone in the audience who has cancer is suddenly reminded of their own position and it depresses them and spoils their night or someone is reminded of someone they've recently lost or someone they're losing. I've never thought of one that I think that's such a funny joke, it's worth the collateral damage. And then he told me this story about when he was on tour once and he was doing you know, club gigs. And he said, you have to remember, he said, it's such an important thing about words being shrapnel and working out how you direct them. He said, I was doing this gig and I was the final act on, I was the headliner. And there were these the two uh, couple in the front row, and they were laughing so much. It was like, you know, he said, you know, sometimes when there's two people and they're laughing so loudly that it can't help but be contagious. And everyone is actually, they're not really laughing at the act. They're laughing at just the joy that is in the room. And he said, afterwards, I went to the bar and they came over to me and they went, oh, Mr. Crimmins, we thought that was so great. We had such a brilliant evening. He said, oh, I'm really glad. He said, it was wonderful to look at your faces. And he said, and then they said, yeah, because it wasn't easy the whole night. I have to say it was quite difficult because we don't come out very much. And he said, oh, you don't come out? They said, nah, no, we, we, we have uh, well, a, a child who has quite severe uh, disabilities. And there's only one person that we know can really look after our child. And, um, and so we only go out maybe once or twice a year. And man, those first three acts, they just kept saying, retard this and retard that. But then you came on very quickly we knew we could trust you and we knew that the people you wanted to drag down were not people like our child and I think you know that to have that in your head to think and, and uh, as an audience we have to be like that as well sometimes we go and see someone who you know is described as an edgy comedian and we laugh at all the jokes that aren't our group but the moment it becomes our group we go oh now I think that is like I remember seeing that there was a woman who was a wheelchair user who went to see Jim Davidson in Plymouth when Jim Davidson refused to go on stage because I think almost the whole front row was people who use wheelchairs and he said oh I can't take the piss out of them no I'm not going to go on and this woman went I have always loved Jim Davidson but I feel very let down and you go I have always loved the man when he's been racist and misogynistic, but now it turns out he can't deal with me either. I feel very let down, right? So when I was 16 years old and I started going to comedy clubs in London, and I'd not the first time I saw Claire Dowie, I don't know if any of you know Claire Dowie, she went on to become a playwright and an author. It was the first time that I had... Well, basically, it was the first time that I had knowingly seen a lesbian. And it was like the... Uh, it was before I saw all those nun films that Ken Russell did. But it was, uh, <laughs> but when I saw Claire Dowie, I was like, this was new. When I saw Felix Dexter, when I saw Jeremy Hardy, when I saw Kit Hollaback, when I saw Linda Smith, all of these people were showing me a new world. They weren't going, oh, let's make the world smaller. They were making it bigger. You know, and, and so I, I you know, the, uh, where this kind of ends up is just saying, I, I think offence ultimately as a, a capitalist model, as a way of just making money, is a pretty tawdry way to use comedy. And I added this as well. Barry Crimmins, again, I love this thing. He, I think he says it actually in, in that movie I was telling you about as well, Call Me Lucky. He says, so the people who think they're clever, this is it, the people I hate most, the people who think they're clever by being like, well, I happen to be politically incorrect. Yeah, and now you get to act like you're a cutting edge rebel because you're reinforcing the oppress oppressive status quo. You sack of fucking rancid horse assholes. <laughs> so, and uh, it doesn't mean that you can't be, but I just think I'm, I'm watching a world where I've never seen so many people who are increasingly of the hard right and beyond in places of power and, you know, doing events in some of the most prestigious, you know, we see this all around and yet we're constantly told the real problem is this snowflake generation and I look at the snowflake generation who are uh, like my son my son is 15 he is the snowflake generation and and I think this is brilliant I think what an amazing thing it is that most of his generation he's in a great big secondary school a huge secondary school and I said to him I said you know what about for some of the kids who are you know if, if, if they're identifying as non-binary or they're identifying as trans I said what's that like you know uh, do, do people get bullied and things like that and he said oh do you know what? in our school if anyone bullied them for that people would just think they 
they were idiots, right? Imagine that for our generation, this thing. You know, and I'm not saying it's perfect everywhere. I know there are people, anyone who is an outsider, school will also always have battles. But the fact there's more and more people who just go, this is just, it's okay. And do you know what? Leave them alone. You know, if you pick on something else, not on that. And I think that that's a, this is, I think, why we've seen some of those comics that have become kind of increasingly right wing, some of these things that we're seeing from kind of, you know, Russell Brand and Joe Rogan and people like that. I think the problem is ego in the way that if you're trying to be progressive, you will screw up, right? Anyone here who knows, anyone who's middle aged like me, and you're trying to get things right and you're trying to learn, but every now and again, someone will get in contact with you and say, do you know what? Do you know the way that you phrase that thing there about kind of non binary stuff? Well, actually. And then you, it's, it's like I remember years and years ago I had a routine about same-sex uh, um, same-sex marriages and that night in uh, where was it Bromsgrove I remember <laughs> Bromsgrove art tricks afterwards someone came up to me and went oh do you know what you said gay marriage and actually it's better to say same-sex marriage rather than gay marriage and I remember one side of me was like going, oh bloody hell I'm just trying to help oh god it's ridiculous and then the other side of me has to go yeah and trying to help means you have to listen as well but for a lot of those people who want to be messiahs uh, more than they really actually want to see a world change, then they have to just go, oh, bloody hell, well, I, I actually think Trump's the outsider now and I'm going to go with him. Because all the right wing come and go, oh, well done, aren't you brilliant? Whereas the left wing are always complaining. Anyway, so fuck them. And uh, you can go whenever you want, right? That's the thing, <laughs> right? I've, I've, got, I've only just begun. Uh, uh, so Viv doesn't have to stay here too late because uh, you, you're bound to have an event with Michael Rosen at 5 a.m. tomorrow morning. You nearly always do. Um, uh, if anyone wants a book, I'll sign books in the interval as well. Uh, and then it kind of you can ask just questions in the second half or whatever. There's so much that I didn't get to, but I, I hope some of it has had some sense. And there's always a little bit of me in my brain. There's always this little thing that goes, not enough jokes, not enough jokes. And then I go, you don't have, this isn't a night of jokes. I can do jokes, but I wanted, there's just, uh, it, some nights, like I think anyone, if you came to the Bibliomaniac launch, for some, it became this really quite serious thing about kind of love and stuff like that. And uh, it's about, I, I was reading a, a book by Andy Warhol. Of course I was. And, uh, and I love this thing he said. He said that he didn't like watching professional comedians and professional entertainers very much. He said because they were so good at what they did, but they knew exactly what they were going to do. Whereas he loved watching amateurs because you don't know what's going to go wrong. And I think the older that I've got, rather than become more professional, in one way I've become more amateur, because I really do find it quite exciting. Even if some nights I will fail you, I realise that. But I find it quite exciting, that thing of just going, well, let's just see what happens. And then some of you might leave and go, that is not what we thought it was going to be at all. And uh, others of you will leave going, oh, that wasn't what I thought it was going to be at all. It's uh, still one of my favourite critiques I've had was uh, a woman who comes to my shows regularly uh, brought her granddad along. Who uh, he was uh, he was a bricklayer and he was in his late seventies and uh, he came up to me afterwards and he went, "I've got to say, I did not understand a word of that, and I've had a lovely night." And I think you know, that's kind of I think I kind of aim for that sometimes. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> Really hope you enjoyed that. And we've got loads of other new ideas coming up. We've got quite a few things that we've made already and we've got plans to make a lot more things. And if you can help, it would be great if you could go to patreon.com slash cosmic shambles to help fund all of our big ideas and some of our quite small ideas. And if you can't afford to, that's absolutely fine as well. Obviously we wanna make these things as free as possible for as many people as possible. But if you can subscribe, there'll probably be a subscribe thing there or there or there or there, uh, that would be fantastic as well.